Welcome back to our little um, video channel, Transgender Disciple, Heaven Come Down, all about my book, all about being trans, all about faith, and all about exploring spiritual life. Thank you for watching, and love it if you can subscribe, and you can also find me on my author page on Facebook, Chrissy Shevasu. And uh, this week, we're going to conclude our little series of four videos on the eunuch. The eunuch through, throughout the Bible, throughout Scripture. Just that, that narrative, that beautiful story <clears throat> that concludes in the book of Acts. So today, um, we're going to look at the Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts, which is really uh, the book in the Bible discussing early church history. And... It, as a conclusion, it's quite um, beautiful to the, to the meta-narrative, the big picture story of eunuchs throughout scripture. And we've tried to share a little bit of um, background contextual history of eunuchs throughout history from ancient times to more recent times to give some kind of context, some kind of fabric within which to earth our understanding of who the eunuchs were and are. So the Holy Spirit commands Philip <clears throat> to travel down the road to Samaria. Doesn't ask him, commands him. <laughs> so there's obviously something unfolding here. And Philip travels down the road to Samaria and he meets an Ethiopian eunuch in a chariot reading a scroll. And the scroll is the book of Isaiah. And the eunuch asks Philip, what's this all about? He's reading Isaiah 53. And he asks you, uh, Philip, what's this story all about? And they get into a dialogue <coughs> about Jesus, um, about the kingdom of heaven. And the eunuch asks if they can be baptised. The church, Christianity, patriarchy, the conventional story, understanding of scripture, struggles to understand that anybody in the Bible could be anything other than straight, cisgendered, heteronormative. And yet that's not really an honest understanding of humanity. It's not an honest understanding of life, people. Because we know that 10% on average in any civilization, any culture, any history, are gender non-conforming, are non-binary in their sexuality. And that's existed from the beginning of time. And so to assume or to see the Ethiopian eunuch as just a straight, um, emasculated or castrated male is not really honest. <clears throat> We've talked a bit about the terror, the horror of castration in ancient times by the Assyrians, the Persians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Romans, and in more recent history, Chinese, um, Korean history. When you castrate a prepubescent young child, boy, do you honestly think that their psyche <coughs> is gonna remain undamaged? Their body will no longer produce testosterone um, and yet they will produce estrogen. They may develop breasts, they'll develop elongated bone structures. Um, and in their identification and in their growing up, even if their culture is a rigid, patriarchal, binary thinking culture, and we know ancient cultures weren't, um, that forces them into a binary gender role, we can safely know from science, from history, from observation, from anthropology, that it's very possible that many of the eunuchs would have been gender non-conforming, would have had an alternative sexuality. And yet Christianity never, never touches on this when it talks about the Ethiopian eunuch. It's dismissed. It's just assumed that this Ethiopian eunuch was male, was a castrated male. Christianity cannot admit for one moment that the Ethiopian eunuch may have been 
um, genderqueer, may have not had a binary um, self-identification, even if they lived that out as a role, as a male masculine role. So we have to be open to inclusion, we have to be open to possibilities. We can't argue from silence either way. So I think the only honest thing to do, humanly speaking, is to consider all possibilities. And when we consider all possibilities, then the, the story has quite a, a gospel ending, quite a glorious ending. Um, um, I'll come to that in a minute. I suppose in Christianese, in jargon, we talk about theology, and we talk about embodied theology, that our theology, by very virtue, is anchored in who we are physically, in our history, in our culture, in our understanding, in our geography, in our privilege, that we see scripture, we see stories, we see people through our particular lens. And the danger of Christianity is that it polices theology. It only accepts theology from cisgendered, heteronormative, um, white, middle-class, middle-aged males, that there are others who read scripture and have, see a different vision. They see different things because they don't have that blinkered vision. Um, and so it's when we talk about inclusion, then we're talking about inclusion at every level, from the very theological heart of our discussion about who God is, how we see God, how we see justice, how we see oppression, how we read and understand stories, then we I, are bringing just another vision um, of theology, not just another understanding of the stories to deepen, to enrich, to widen the church's vocabulary, its narrative, its language. And I keep coming back to this, but Christianity has seek, sought to erase um, non-binary um, theology, non-binary witness, non-binary um, narrative f from its story. So who was the Ethiopian eunuch? It says that the Ethiopian eunuch was the treasurer for Queen Candice. So immediately we know this is an incredibly capable person, that they are bilingual at least, if not speaking several languages, dialects. They are reading the Hebrew scriptures, they've been to Jerusalem, um, and they're returning to Ethiopia. It's very possible that the Ethiopian eunuch was a convert or an acolyte of Judaism and had gone to Jerusalem <coughs> to visit the temple. But because of the ancient Jewish law that no one who's been emasculated by cutting or crushing can enter the assembly of God's people, the eunuch still would not have been able to enter the temple, would have been kept in the outer courts where all the trade was carried on, would not be able to enter into the inner courts and enjoy fellowship with the rest of God's people. <clears throat> so he was excluded. Did they know that on the way, on the journey there? Or did they find it out when they were there? Were they struggling with being rejected? <clears throat> um, and yet they were still seeking after God. They were still seeking, seeking life, meaning, truth. The eunuch asks Philip to be baptised. And Philip says yes, without hesitation, and baptises the eunuch there and then. And in baptism, Philip is saying, <laughs> welcome, welcome into the church, welcome into the fellowship of God's people. And as the eunuch goes under the water and is baptised, they are welcomed into fellowship with God's people. And the ancient law becomes insignificant, becomes meaningless. The law of exclusion is just washed away in the waters of baptism. And all of a sudden you have this um, probably black, um, excluded figure welcomed into the, into the church. And the church was predominantly made up of Jews. Um, the composition of the church at that time was very much a Jewish institution. And it would have been an explosive event 
Uh, and Philip's reporting of the event could well have got him into big trouble with those who subscribe to purity laws, to the law and to the religious confines and restrictions of Judaism. All of a sudden, all those things are exploded. I think it's a mistake, it's a presumption to assume that the eunuch was a he, that they weren't a they, that they were in some way non-binary, that they didn't identify strictly as male, and that God accepted them in their non-binary state. Uh, and that is the explosive nature of this story. This is the beautiful conclusion. <clears throat> this is the welcome home for the eunuch for all time, for all eternity. One of the dynamics in the story of the Ethiopian eunuch is this tension that the church finds between law and grace. Christianity's unique claim as a religion, its boast is that it is a religion of grace and not law, that Christianity claims to be the only religion that offers people um, salvation, heaven, um, nirvana, paradise, and that the, you don't have to work for it, it's a free gift. All we have to do is believe, all we have to do believe is that God loves you, <clears throat> that Jesus died for you, um, and that anything else is, is law, is works, that if we try and earn, we can never earn our, our way to God, that we can never be good enough. If, we spend, if I spend the rest of my life trying to be good, I'll never be good enough for God that I am saved by grace, that heaven is mine because of grace, that I can enter nirvana, paradise, heaven, um, through faith, through belief. <clears throat> like the thief on the cross, the thief who was dying next to Jesus, and said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me where you are going. And Jesus turns his head to the thief on the cross and says, today you will be with me in paradise. That's grace. That's the beautiful gift of grace, that we can be right with God, that we can enjoy a relationship with God, we can enjoy rightness with God, we can enjoy the peace, the joy, the love that comes from knowing Christ. <clears throat> and knowing Christ living in us through grace. And yet, when it becomes to the LGBT community, we are subject to the law and we are judged by the law. <clears throat> and it's a tragedy, it's a travesty of double thinking, double standards of hypocrisy, of a religious hypocrisy. Because what are we asking for <clears throat> as trans people or as gay? Um, what are we asking for? Are we welcome at the table? Are we welcome at your table? <clears throat> Are we welcome in leadership? That's all we're asking. We're just asking to be treated the same as you. But we're subject to your laws, to your judgment. Um, and yet we see in the baptism of the Ethiopian unit, the law is washed away. It's rendered as nothing. And yet Christians and the church continually try and condemn me and us as transgender by citing Deuteronomy 22.5. Any man who wears a woman's clothing or any woman who wears a man's clothing is detestable to God. It's just such an irrational leap. Just a few verses away from this law that condemned the eunuch to eternal separation and exclusion from God's people is this verse about... Um, supposedly about trans people being detestable to God. You're allowed to eat prawns and bacon, and yet the homosexual is condemned by your law. <clears throat> it's such an absurd hypocrisy, and it, it really comes home when you have examples of how the church exercises judgment in reality. And Pam and invite uh, have been involved in the church community for many years and there was a time <clears throat> a couple of decades ago where we were part of a community and we had within that community an incredibly Pentecostal, in-your-face, happy-clappy, um, evangelistic 
uh, Christian. And it transpired that despite his stories about needing to divorce his wife because she was being unreasonable, it transpired that he had actually systematically been raping his two daughters. And we watched over the years the church welcome this man back in, um, seeking to restore him, to cover him in grace, to cover his sin in grace, to rehabilitate him after years in prison, and even to the extent of finding him a job in the local theological college where he reoffended. I watched that um, outpouring of grace uh, upon this man who commits perhaps what in our day and age is the ultimate sin. And yet I watched the same church condemning and excluding uh, my, mar- my gay friends who are married and have been married for decades in faithful, loving marriage, or the young gay couple or lesbian couple, simply because they enjoy a loving relationship. They come under the law and the judgment. That, to me, illustrates just the blind, warped, prejudiced, homophobia, transphobia that the evangelical church is closed in. It is a horrific story, it's a painful story, and in some ways I'm sorry to share it. And yet we have to share it to expose the double standards that evangelicals live under, that they claim to be soaked in grace, and yet at the same time they're quite happy and content to subject their gay LGBT friends to judgment. So, again, when you unpack the story of the Ethiopian eunuch, it is a story that reveals the glory and the power of how grace washes away the power of the law forever. And we've not even got on to talking about how the blood of Jesus is infinitely more costly and precious than the, than the muddy waters of a river that the Ethiopian eunuch was baptised in. So for me and for us, the story of the Ethiopian eunuch is really the story of God saying, welcome home, baby. You belong. This is where you belong. You belong in my heart. You belong with my people. And there is no law. There is no judgment. There is no condemnation over you any longer. And that's my message to my trans friends, that's my message to the LGBT community, that we are no longer under the law. That the only law that we're under is the, the religious conspiracies and prejudice blinkered theology of a very uh, conservative and out of date and out of touch church. So I hope that makes a little bit of sense. I hope it just reveals another perspective on how we can understand Scripture and how we can understand the Bible. Um, It's rooted in Scripture. It's rooted in the Bible. It's rooted in decades of studying the Bible. Um, And it's part of my passion. It's part of what I believe. And it's a message of hope. It's a message of love. It's a message of radical inclusion. And I hope you... um, feel included and welcomed and that the yoke of judgment, the yoke of shame, the yoke of condemnation is broken off you forever. Um, That's all for this week and I'm sure that's enough to chew on and look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a great week and love you lots and uh, yeah, see you soon. Bye.